And there's the sharing of photographs and stories. And even though they don't talk about the war with their children, there are still some great points that come up. Frank Manger, who is in the platoon, turns out from finding his photograph, he was in my dad's Tarawa platoon as well and, and went over to the scout snipers with my dad. And, uh, you know, it's not as though it's anything in the book, but it turns out that his childhood sweetheart was in the USO and tap danced with Mickey Rooney and Bo Jangles is the person who taught her to tap dance up and down stairs. It's just like wonderful, you know, colorful things. And then you get more important uh, things that you discover, like from, it was just maybe 10 months ago uh, in January when a fellow named Bill Marshall contacted me and he said his dad was in my platoon, his mother was in my dad's platoon. And I thought, well, there's nobody in that platoon named Marshall. This guy is just fishing for something. And throughout all of my posts uh, about the platoon, I always wish Albert Malanga a happy birthday. And because he was Italian-American, I talk about the racial and religious biases at the time and how difficult it was for Italian-Americans. And uh, it turns out that the it was so hard for Albert Malanga that he changed his name to Albert Marshall, and he was alive just this past December. So for all the time that I was working on this book, talking to his buddies, Roscoe Mullins, Bob Smots, Marvin Strombo, Bill Knuppel, he was alive, and I didn't know it. And that has been the greatest disappointment of this whole journey, it was, it was that he was alive and I didn't have the opportunity to talk to him. But I found out from his son that his nickname in the platoon was the Flamingo because he had such a wonderful singing voice. And his son shared uh, a lot of those, his songs with us that he performed. And one of them we used on our paperback release video. And I think it was called um, A Long Time Companion or something like that. And I've, you know, it struck me as kind of, um, wondrous that even though it's a song that's a love song, it is so relatable to the platoon and all of these guys who really had vows that were no different than, than wedding vows through richer or poor, sickness and health. I mean, they took care of each other. I think one of the guys said um, about the platoon is that these guys had a love for each other that no girlfriend, wife, or mother could ever equal. And you know, that's why they could not see each other for 50 years and they're just you know, still longtime companions. But my name is Joseph Tahovsky and I am the co-author of 40 Thieves on Saipan. The 40 Thieves on Saipan is a book about an elite uh, unit of Marines in the Pacific during World War II. Uh, there were the uh, 6th Marine Regiment's Scout and Sniper Platoon. And the Scout and Sniper Platoons of World War II were very unique. There were only two platoons like that that were deployed in the Pacific. Uh, one was for Tarawa, which was just a 72-hour bloodbath. And the other was for Saipan, which is where these gentlemen were deployed. And they were trained to live and work behind enemy lines for days and weeks at a time. Uh, where firing a weapon would be their last option. So they were trained in specific black death skills, as Sergeant Bill Knuppel told me, um, to kill and cripple silently, uh, as he put it, in ways that you can't even imagine. The story of the 40 Thieves is, is true. It's uh, my father led the platoon. Uh, I discovered uh, this all from a eulogy that was delivered at his funeral. It, spoke about some of his exploits on Saipan, which made me curious to do an online search, which turned up an article called Tahovsky's Terrors uh, from the 1944 December Leatherneck Magazine. And uh, beneath it was a little bit of text from the person who submitted it, and his name was Chris Tipton. And the text said, this is my father's platoon during World War II. And he said, everything in the article is true, except we were never known as terrors. We were known as the 40 thieves. So even before I 
thought about writing a book, the title was staring me in the face. Well, after the uh, discovery of the article, that prompted me to open my dad's footlocker, uh, which was kept in the garage under many other boxes, never opened up for decades. And uh, opening it was like Christmas. It was like time travel. Uh, so many saved memories of the day. Uh, racetrack forms from Agua Caliente in Tijuana. And uh, all of the letters that he sent my mother during World War II, and then all of his platoon rosters as well for Guadalcanal, Tarawa, and Saipan, his scout and sniper unit. And looking at that platoon roster, one name really stuck out for me, and that was Knuppel, William F., his sergeant. And Bill Knuppel, who's from Morris, Minnesota, was a Marine buddy that we'd visit all the time in Arizona. He was only ever introduced as a Marine buddy. And uh, it didn't strike me as curious until much later, but every time Bill would want to talk about the war with Dad, my dad would just say, Bill, those days are over. And Bill would tacitly comply. And it was now very um, amazing that even as 80-year-old men, they still had this relationship of sergeant to lieutenant. Fortunately, in finding this platoon roster, I was able to locate uh, several men from the platoon who were still alive. Um, Roscoe Mullins in West Virginia, Bob Smots in Georgia, and Marvin Strombo in, in Montana. And uh, through Bill Knuppel, um, because unlike my father, who didn't speak about the war at all. Uh, after my father passed away in 2011, I was paying visits to Bill, and I would take out the platoon roster and some other memorabilia, and uh, he would tell stories about the platoon, about the time they stole a pig on Hawaii to have a barbecue, about soliciting two army soldiers to go AWOL and join the platoon for the invasion of Saipan and many other stories about their nefarious activities. And because of all of that information, when I would visit Smots or Mullins or Strombo, I knew things about the platoon that you would only know if you'd been there. And I think it was that intimate knowledge of their unit that made them open old wounds and share the stories that they did with me because they talked to me the way they had never spoken to anyone about before in their lives. I decided to write the book um, after many different trips to see these, these men all over the United States, from Georgia to Arizona to Montana to West Virginia, collecting all of these stories. And I assembled this big jigsaw puzzle box of memories. They'd give me photographs and letters and share all kinds of material with me. I found the uh, nephews of Don Evans, who lived in the Washington area, and they gave me all of the letters that he wrote home to his folks in Kansas City and photographs and memories. And at a certain point in time, I wanted to put it together in chronological order. And uh, first attempt at writing the book uh, resulted in oral history of over 600 pages that was very dry and unreadable, and all of the gold nuggets that these gentlemen provided me were kind of lost through uh, details that were a little unnecessary. And that's where my co-author, Cynthia, stepped in and helped to put together uh, a book that was very representative of what these men had to live through during World War II. The stories that stand out most are the ones that are assemblies of different memories. Uh, for instance, the push into the valley that Bill Knuppel talks about when one of the squads walks into an ambush and three are killed and three seriously wounded. Uh, that story begins with Knuppel and then progresses through Smots, who was actually on point 
f on that mission. So he was there and saw everything that happened. And then Marvin Strombo contributes. And it finishes up with, uh, with Bill Knuppel again. So to assemble the memories, and all of those were told as sort of different stories. But then as I started to put the pieces together, I realized this was one episode in the book. Uh, other episodes that stand out are um, when Bill Knuppel and Don Evans from Kansas City, Don, Mr. Kansas City, um, made port in Honolulu right before the whole convoy shipped out for Saipan. And Don had two army buddies, and they visited them at Schofield Barracks. So I get the story about how Knuppel and Evans seduced these two army privates to join the Marines for the Battle of Saipan from Bill Knuppel verbatim with dialogue. Same thing with Bill's story about the pig roast. Um, another story that is very impactful was from Roscoe Mullins and Marvin Strombo. And there was a corporal in the platoon named Martin Dyer. And um, he was kind of a loner, but he and Marvin struck up a good friendship because they shared bunks on Saipan, on the voyage to Saipan aboard the USS Bolivar. And um, on the voyage, Dyer told Strombo about his premonition that he would die on Saipan. And uh, on a mission on June 29th, Strombo is looking over at Dyer, who's getting instructions from my father, the lieutenant, on the mission that he's sending him out on. And Strombo's looking at Martin Dyer, and he's just white as a sheet of paper. And everything became a blur. You hear all of these stories from men of that era who talk about these surreal moments where they hear voices and things like this. And this is one for Marvin Strombo, where he saw Dyer as a ghost. And uh, before Dyer left, he went, uh, he pointed over to Marvin. And Marvin didn't think he was pointing at him until he said, no, you. And then he saluted goodbye. And then Mullins continues the story because he was in the Dyer's squad that went out that night and was there when Dyer got killed. And um, Roscoe said that the night was so quiet that you could hear the sound of Tipton, another fellow from the platoon, um, tearing sulfa packets. And you could hear the powder hitting the wounds and the hissing and the gurgling of the blood. And that the only thing else you could hear that night was Dyer calling out for his mama until you couldn't hear that anymore. Now, who can write that? These guys lived it. And that's you know Roscoe's memory verbatim. The book begins uh, with Bob Smott's memory of that day when the squad walked to an into an ambush of four machine guns. And Bob Smott's, when he was telling me about it, he said, everybody knew it was a bad idea. And uh, when I finally figured out how to begin the book, I realized that is how the book would have to begin. Well, 40 Thieves is provided from Warren Tipton, who told his son Chris that that's what the platoon was named. So it's actually one of the guys from the platoon who uh, gave them the moniker, or told me about the moniker that they were known as the 40 Thieves. And since the battle that they were uh, deployed for was Saipan, the title became 40 Thieves on Saipan. Well, Marines of World War II, uh, in general, were notorious thieves. And these guys obviously excelled at the craft, um, thusly being named the 40 Thieves by the rest of their regiment. And uh, one of the stories, well, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit. Bill Knuppel always said that he had a buddy who wrote a book about, about their unit. And I didn't think anything of it until the buddy turned out to be Leon Uris. And his first book was Battle Cry. 
which is his sort of fictionalized account of the 6th Marine Regiment during World War II, and Eurus and Knuppel were in the same H Company uh, for Guadalcanal and Tarawa. And it was sort of the end of the Guadalcanal. And uh, in the book, Eurus writes about this notorious band of thieves and all of the exploits that they're doing in the 6th Regiment. And uh, one of the incidents involved an army colonel's jeep. So I get really excited about thinking that, well, maybe these thieves are in my dad's platoon. And so I go to all of the guys, did you ever steal an army colonel's jeep? And Marvin Strombo looked at me a little curiously and sort of said no. And I asked Roscoe Mullins the same question. And he just laughed and, and shook his head. And I finally got to Bob Smots and said, Bob, did you guys ever steal an army colonel's jeep? And he said no, at which point I was just deflated. But he went on, it was an army captain's jeep and we beat the hell out of that thing. One thing um, to go back to um, like beginning the book um, because that happened, a lot of epiphanies happened at that time where um, uh, Marvin Strombo, I don't know if you recall the years ago, maybe 2017, there was a World War II Marine who returned a flag to a family in Japan. That was Marvin Strombo. That was one of my guys. And he acquired that flag on, during the Battle of Saipan, and, which is chapter 26, I think, in the book. And um, I was going with him to return the flag, and someone had given me um, the book Unbroken to read. And prior to this, people were telling me, well, you've got to start the book at some place in the middle where it's a life and death situation and then leave them hanging and then start at the beginning. beginning. I thought, who writes that way? You know, Gone with the Wind doesn't begin, frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a damn. Um, but when I started reading the book, that's how Unbroken began. And that's when I realized how the book should begin on that day, which every man remembered with great clarity and provided the story of the squad getting wiped out, and Bob Smots was on point that day, and he said everybody knew it was a bad idea. So the battle for Saipan was a very bold move in the Pacific at that time. It was thousands of miles beyond any other Allied installation, but the acquisition of Saipan with the adjacent islands of Guam and Tinian would do two things. Um, sever the lines of communication between Tokyo and its bases farther west, and uh, two of the finest airfields would fall into the Allied possession, the Esledo airfield on Saipan and the Ushi Airdrome on Tinian. And the uh, Ushi Airdrome had runways long enough to accommodate the super fortresses of the day, and uh, that's where the Enola Gay was launched from in 1945. The war in the Pacific was uh, a terribly bloody and brutal war, and casualties mounted from island to island to island. And the Battle of Tarawa, which directly preceded the invasion of Saipan, was known as Bloody Tarawa because within 72 hours, um, over 5,000 Japanese were killed and 5,000 Marines wounded or killed in an area the size of Central Park. And Saipan was even bloodier than that. Um, and it's a battle that's sort of lost in, in the history annals because every other battle after that became more perilous. Iwo Jima, Okinawa, uh, the Battle of the Philippines was still being waged after the Japanese surrendered. My father at the time was a lieutenant in the 6th Marine Regiment. And uh, through his actions during the Battle of Tarawa, uh, the high command tagged him to lead and uh, organize and train this unique group of Marines uh, for the Battle of Saipan, the Scout and Snipers, otherwise known as the 40 Thieves. And uh, Bill tells the story about how they were going to go about choosing the men for the platoon. And all my father wanted to do was look at the record books. 
And uh, Bill said, don't you want to interview these guys? He said, no, I want to look at the record books first. And said, Bill asked, what are we looking for? And he said, I want to see if anybody's got brig time. You know, if they've been thrown in, 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 in the brig for brawling or drunkenness. And Bill said, why, why, do you, why is that important? He said, well, the guy that wins the fight is thrown in the brig. The loser goes to the infirmary. The guy in the brig is the kind of guy I want. There's one episode that is Bob Smott's story as well as Roscoe Mullins' story about the platoon training on, Saipan, um, on Hawaii for the invasion of Saipan. And at the time, Hawaii wasn't a state. And it wasn't, there were a lot of Japanese sympathizers and Japanese civilians who lived on the island. In fact, if the Battle of the Midway had gone contrary and the Japanese had won, they could have walked into Hawaii unopposed, where half the population would have uh, embraced them. So in Hawaii, there was this little village of Pololu. And this is Bob Smott's story, because he went on this training mission where my dad sent them up into the Koala Mountains, um, because the Parker Ranch, where they were situated, uh, the Koala Mountains was in the distance. And given technology of the day, they were supposed to signal my father that they'd gotten to the position by laying out a white sheet on the hillside. And that way he could tell they'd gotten there on time. But on the mountain, they met this Chinese farmer who showed them a viaduct through the mountain that connected the Waipio Valley on one side, very verdant farmland, with uh, sugarcane processing plants on the other side, and this viaduct transported the sugarcane. Um, so they waded through the mountain, got to the Waipio Valley on the other side, and then the Chinese farmer shows them, moving farther north up the coast, three fingerlit canyons that are cut into the side of Hawaii. He mentioned that he lived in the first canyon, but in the third canyon there were Japanese submarines that would dock there and be resupplied by this village of Pololu, which was just adjacent to this third canyon. And uh, he said that um, the village was filled with Japanese sympathizers, so much so that all of the men had been sent away to an internment camp. Uh, and the whole village just consisted of women and children. And the woman who ran the general store was the head spy. So this is Bob's story, and they decide they're all going to wander in to this village. And the old woman um, sees these Marines come into her, their unauthorized town, and she immediately rounds up a bunch of girlfriend types, as Bob call, calls them, young women. You know, they're just as happy to see boys their own age as the guys are to see girls their own age. And it didn't matter that they were Japanese or Marines, and they just started to have fun. But they were trying to get information out of them. Um, finally, they get busted by the head of the Hawaiian Home Guard, who is going to rat them out to General Holland Smith, you know, who is the leader of the whole 2nd Marine Division, which the 6th Marines were part of. And, but first, before he sends them back to camp, he invites them to their house for lunch and coffee. So that's just Bob's story. So you kind of take him at his word. Um, shortly after we finished the book and sent it off to our editor for edits, I get a message from a fellow named Richard Zuziak, whose dad, John, was in the platoon. His name is the last one on the roster. And he said, would, uh, you know, he saw that I had been wishing his dad happy, happy birthday and posts. And um, he contacted me, and we chatted for a bit. And then he finally said, do you want my dad's war photos? And I said, sure, thinking they were just USMC issued, because you couldn't carry a camera during World War II. That would be tantamount to spying. But evidently, John Zuziak had a camera. And he was there in Pololu. And there are all of these wonderful photographs of the guys in this village. There's a picture of the girlfriend types who are all just such beautiful young women. Um, there's a picture of them taken with the old woman who's the head spy and she 
just such good care of them that the caption underneath the name, they called her mom. And there's even a picture of them at the head of the Hawaiian Home Guards house. So just from this old gentleman's memory, we get this photographic evidence that just made us immediately have to jump back in and do some rewrites. And then we had you know, photographs too to provide for that, for that story in the book. The journey of this book has been such an incredible experience. Uh, not just from meeting the old gentlemen of today who were once warriors in the Pacific. Um, it was wonderful not only to get to know them as these little old gentlemen, but also as their sepia tone photographed young boys and how reckless and crazy and, and fearless they were. Um, and then all of the relatives, the siblings and nephews and nieces of, uh, uh, and children of the 40 thieves that I've uh, come to meet and immediately develop this uh, kinship with them. And I'm, through reading the book and their fathers always being so reticent to speak about the war, it, it finally sort of answered their question of what, what did you do in the war, Daddy? Because now you know, because even if they're not specifically mentioned in any of these episodes, this is what they did. This is how they lived. And that's what they needed to do to survive. The, the journey has been somewhat therapeutic um, in that it explained a lot of dad's idiosyncrasies growing up, how he'd never take me to see fireworks. And you can understand that of uh, all of these different landings and the salvos that are being fired. Uh, Bob Smots talks about the USS California firing its 14 inch guns and the ship would lurch back in the waves and the sound of the shells being like freight train after freight train after freight train passing by. And you could see, I could understand now why he wouldn't want me to take, take me to see fireworks. Um, and also how he'd rarely sleep in bed at night. I mean, he might start out there, but inevitably, if I got up at two or three in the morning to get a glass of water, he'd be reading a book. And I think it was just, God, it was just a year or two before dad died when I asked him, how come, you know, why don't you sleep at night? And he goes, I don't know, it's old habit, I guess. The Japanese were always active at night, so I'm really not too restful at night. Um, so it was therapeutic in that regard, but also a great regret that he never wanted to speak of it before, and I never knew any of these things, so I could get his opinion of the push into the valley and Don Evans and Martin Dyer and all of the crazy things that his boys used to do. I know that dad would love David Letterman and all of the crazy things that Letterman did and uh, like dropping watermelons off of the Empire State Building or what have you or, or 30 Rockefeller. And, and I realized that that's because his boys did such crazy things probably and that's why you know, he enjoyed that so much. Oh, a great regret that he never discussed it at all. There are some times when uh, he would open up about some specifics, and that would be when my father would have my mother, uh, pardon me, that would happen when my brother would have my father and mother narrate photo albums. And he, there might be a photo of a guy named Goofy Guthrie and they were both on the USS Maryland football team. That was their first stationing together. And they, the, the USS Maryland football team won the Vanderbilt Cup in 1939. And he and Goofy Guthrie were both uh, stars of the team. And uh, he'd just point at, uh, at uh, Goofy and say, he died on wake, which had no significance to me until you read about the Battle of Wake Island. And, and realize that that was quite 
the sacrifice. They, f they fought to the end, and, and those that did surrender didn't meet such a, a very good fate. And that's when it became apparent to the Marines that you do not want to be taken captive by the Japanese, that yeah, nothing could be worse than being taken captive. In fact, um, they, the platoon, in being unique and working behind enemy lines for days and weeks at a time, it could be possible that you would be captured or taken alive. Um, they uh, made a pact because the, this uh, concept of no man being left behind didn't apply to the scout snipers because they were told in no uncertain terms that if a guy can't make it back on their own, you were supposed to leave them because trying to get them back might jeopardize the mission. And they all made a pact that they wouldn't leave the wounded alive. And that's just how they thought it should be. At one point, one of the early missions that I needed to accomplish was to track down any of these thieves and to see if they were still alive and failing that families of the 40 thieves. So fortunately, I was able to find three other survivors besides Bill Knuppel. Um, they were Roscoe Mullins in West Virginia, Bob Smots in Georgia, and Marvin Strombo in West Virginia. And uh, through a lot of intimate details that Bill Knuppel provided, um, that opened the door with these three men, and I was immediately welcomed into their family. And uh, it was really wonderful not only getting to know them, but their children as well, and what a kinship we developed together. Um, other family members from my introductory letters to addresses found online uh, turned up Al Yunker Jr. Al Yunker was in the platoon. Um, he was the surly sergeant mentioned in my father's eulogy at the University of Wisconsin. And, uh, and Al Jr. shared stories uh, with me. Uh, I was able to track down Don Evans' nephews. Don Evans, Mr. Kansas City, died on Saipan through his mother's grave that was relocated from Kansas City to somewhere in Washington, D.C. I was able to find that information online and track down his nephews and find them. And uh, finding Don Evans' family had been Bill Knuppel's uh, mission all through his life because Bill and Don were good friends. And you contacted you know, your friend's family if your buddy didn't make it home. And he was never able to find the family because they relocated from Kansas City out to the Washington, D.C. area. And I was able to track them down through just the movement of a, of a grave. Um, I was able to find Richard Zuziak, John Zuziak's son, and get all of those great photographs that his father took that helped put faces to names mentioned. Uh, Warren Tipton, the f father of Chris Tipton, who posted that article. If he wouldn't have posted that article, I never would have known that they were the 40 Thieves and were known about Warren Tipton because he was a fellow that Bob Smots would talk about, Warren Tipton. They gave him a, a nickname that began with an H. He thought it might be Herman. Well, Warren's middle initial is H, and it's Hobart. And in the Zuziak photos, there's this big corn-fed lummox of a smiling goof who's Hobart, who was just 17 when he joined the platoon, and his 18th birthday was June 15th, 1944, the day they landed on Saipan. Well, I think it's very important to preserve the stories of these men because they're stories that they never told while they were alive. If Bill hadn't shared his memories and stories with me, uh, that never would have opened the doors with the other men, and Bill passed away in 2014. To have uh, Bob Smots share so much of his experiences of uh, stealing the Jeep with his buddy Daniel Kenny. Um, 
of how his buddy got killed on Saipan. That would have all been dust in the wind. The same thing with Marvin Strombo, and both Marvin and uh, Bob passed away as well. Roscoe's still alive, and he's still kicking in West Virginia. And uh, every time I see him, he's got that book in his hand, and it uh, became uh, almost a, a, a duty on my part and Cynthia's part to write this book to, as, as a dedication to their sacrifice and what they had to do and, and, and to let their children know why they never talked about this their entire life. It's, it wasn't pretty. Writing letters during World War II was a terribly important thing if you were either a child writing home to parents or a husband writing home to your wife or, or your, your parents. Because um, technology, you couldn't even make a phone call back in those days. If you had enough money, maybe you could sell it, send a telegram. But writing was the only means of communication. And depending upon whether you're going into combat or stationed in New Zealand or Hawaii or Iceland, um, it could take two weeks to a month for your family to receive a letter, let alone respond to anything in that letter. So for married men, it was very important to write home every day because a letterless day followed by another letterless day meant one of two things. Either he was coming home and he couldn't write or that he'd been killed. So writing was terribly important and Fortunately, my mother saved every letter that my dad ever wrote to her. So that spans from 1940 to 1945. Sometimes one or two letters a day she'd write, and, and he would reciprocate. But, uh, you know, having mentioned the off-limits footlocker, it's only so big. And, you know, letters take up a lot of space. And I was wondering, I was been searching and searching in the garage for Roxy's letters to Frank. I could never find them. And then uh, there is one letter that he wrote from Hawaii when he told her that he read every letter for the last time and then burned them. And then the next letter he writes home, why didn't I just ship them home? <laughs> so there is a little bit of regret on his part. But, um, and it would have been great to have more of her letters to him. There's some that, that were saved before he shipped out and some later letters that, uh, were, uh, that he was able to keep after the Battle of Saipan. But uh, there is one wonderful letter that I found also through this investigative work of reading every one of those letters um, was before my dad shipped out for Guadalcanal, which would have been October of 1942, um, my mother wrote a little goodbye letter to him and folded it up and slipped it into the pocket of his khaki uniform, which he has packed away. Um, she did that so when he landed and unpacked, he could open it up and, and read you know, her goodbye. So it, it's, it's mentioned in a letter and uh, that he had found it when he landed in New Zealand in maybe December, he mentions that he, he found the letter. So um, I'm thinking that it had been burned with all of the other letters until he writes uh, the letter home on June 8th, 1944, before the Battle of Saipan. He mentions that he carries that letter with him always um, along with her photograph. And I remembered in the footlocker, there was this little leather at sort of wallet thing and you open it up and there's a picture of Roxy. So I go behind the picture and pull out this letter that I refer to as the khaki letter and, and read it. It was just, you know, terribly su a sweet moment. People back then had to pay attention. I wouldn't say any more or less than today, but it was a different type of attention. Here, everything is so immediate. You know, if you don't respond to a text message and within five minutes, are you being rude or are you driving? What's, what's keeping you from responding? And back then, I, I think 
you had to be, it had to be a more patient world because communication just took that amount of time. Uh, to, it's, it's very funny reading these letters that my father and mother are writing back and forth were having an argument. So she says something in a letter, he gets ticked off by it, writes it back. Well, she's not getting that response until two weeks from then, so who knows if she's forgotten about their argument or not. So that was one of the uh, more humorous things about reading all of this these love letters, because they really didn't know each other much before they got married. There were a lot of wartime marriages before men shipped out where they got the uh, required Wasserman test uh, before they could get married. And um, uh, Captain Edwards, who is my dad's CO uh, on Tarawa, he, as well as Joe Dulcich, one of dad's lieutenant buddies, and uh, another fellow all got married in August of 1942, and you know by October they're on a ship bound for Guadalcanal. Some correspondence in those days was a little bit more formal, and Mom and her letters was very flamboyant and overreactive. And there's one letter where you can tell that dad made the mistake of mentioning that he had malaria. So all of a sudden, he's getting deluged with letters from Roxy, my mom, about malaria, its side effects, and why wasn't he being shipped home. And, and finally, dad writes this two-page letter about malaria. You, it's funny that you're telling me about malaria uh, as though I know nothing. And uh, how, about how everyone in the Pacific has had malaria. And if everybody got shipped home, there'd be nobody left. You can rest assured that we get the best of medical attention and really sugarcoating the whole scenario when I have diary entries of Bill Knuppel uh, talking about his experiences with malaria and how awful it is because the only treatment for malaria at that time was quinine and they'd run out of pills frequently. So to dispense the quinine, they would take tissue and make a little divot here, pour the powder into tissue, twist the ends of it, and then you'd have to put it in the mouth and drink water really fast to get it down or else it would just burn terribly. So the letters that are written home from, say, Don Evans to his parents are much different than the letters that Frank writes to Roxy, where he's really downplaying everything that's going on. Like even when he wins the Silver Star um, for wiping out a, a pillbox on Tarawa single-handed. Uh, he said, uh, he said something about, there wasn't much going on where I was on the island, so there's no need for you to worry. A pillbox is a fortified installation made out of cement and coconut logs covered with sand or other uh, natural uh, surroundings so you really don't see it, but it would have slits that the machine guns would come out of that would fire upon anyone else. So a pillbox would be a very uh, difficult position to um, get around. And the one pillbox that was that scenario was a few stories high. And it had um, two companies of Marines pinned down. And Dad had already progressed beyond it. But he noticed that it was pinned down, pinned down. So he got a group of his men to go up to the top of it. And they're climbing up very intensely. And I know this because he delivered a speech to a Rotary Club. And this is in the speech. So I know, know how this happened. Um, he's climbing up to the top of the hill. But he's so intent on climbing that he doesn't know that the Japanese in the pillbox had spotted, had spotted his unit coming up. And they're throwing grenades at them. But my dad is so intent on climbing that he doesn't see the grenades. So he finally gets to the top and looks behind him, and none of his guys are there. And he's up there by himself. And the trap door on the pillbox opens up, and this Japanese head pops out. And luckily, he was able to kill him and then throw some grenades down inside. 
And then, you know, by that time, some of his other men ran up to the top and they went in and they just, uh, you know, disabled the machine guns and, and that was that. But that's what he got the Silver Star for. Well, Don Evans was one of my father's squad leaders in the 40 Thieves. Uh, a platoon is 40 men, thus they were the 40 Thieves, and uh, each platoon consisted of four squads. Don Evans led one, Martin Dyer led another, William Knipe, and August Schieber. But uh, Don Evans was, he was the quintessential big man on campus. He was the star of any Southeast Knights sporting team back in high school in Kansas City. Um, he had many different girls writing him letters. He turned down a football scholarship at, uh, for the University of Kansas to enlist in the Marine Corps. And he was, I don't know, he wouldn't be elected, he won the Mr. Kansas City contest, not once, but twice, as a 16, 17-year-old kid. He was just built as, uh, as Bill Knuppel would use in parlance of the day, he was built like Charles Atlas. Fortunately, the finding of Don Evans' nephews led to all of the letters that he ever sent home to his mother, and some of them are just quite precious because she still thinks of Don as this little innocent Sunday school boy that was just sent off to war and he writes this letter home. If you think I'm, you know, some sheltered little lad, well, somebody's awfully deluded. Um, the war out here in the Pacific isn't being fought in a church and a pistol provides more comfort to me than a Bible. So quit your worrying. And he, he does this all the time with his mother and talks about, you know, the girls that he dates and how he's got two fiancés stateside and a, a Maori girl and uh, all of these other things that you would never dream of saying to your mother. So and, uh, fortunately, you know, with Cynthia's help, we were able to incorporate some of these letters that not only he wrote home, but that his mom wrote to him or sweethearts would write to him. And, uh, and that was, just, you know, once again, it's just part of the process of putting the flesh on the bones of their stories and uh, how we were able to incorporate all of this lovely material that uh, Don's nephews provided. He, was, he died in the uh, episode that begins the book, the push into the valley, when uh, they walked into an ambush of uh, four woodpeckers. And the woodpecker was a nickname that the Marines gave to a certain type of Japanese machine gun due to its staccato peck, peck, pecking sound. Um, and um, Jesus, the Ipana kid Orozco, one of the uh, 40 thieves, told his son, that I learned from his son, um, that it was such a fierce weapon that it could cut a man in half in a matter of seconds. And um, Bob Smots was on point that day when Don Evans killed, and he, he said he turned around and before he could shout out a warning, he just watched the machine gun fire erupt from the canyon walls, and the bullets just sort of chewed Evans' body and just a bloody pile of rags. Recently, I just got back from Hawaii, uh, and I went there to specifically visit the graves of not only Don Evans, but there are five other fellows mentioned in the book who are buried there. Um, Corporal Martin Dyer, um, Colonel McLeod, who was the executive officer of the 6th Marine Ed Regiment, and someone that dad served with from Iceland through Saipan. Um, his best buddy, Pappy Moorhead, um, who actually died on Tarawa. But um, the reason why so many boys are buried at the National Cemetery of the Pacific um, was at the time during World War II, if your child was killed overseas and you wanted their body sent home, you'd have to pay for it. And at the time, I think the cost was something like 
$500, which translates into about two years salary before taxes, because people only got paid maybe $20, $30 a month back in those days. So you would have to be a Rockefeller to be able to afford to have your son's uh, or daughter's body sent home. And that's why there are tens of thousands of 19, 20 year old boys. It's very, it's very impactful going there and seeing, you know, grave after grave of just 19, 20, 19, 20, 20, 21 year olds, just one after the other. Marvin Strombo was one of the 40 thieves. And back in 2017, um, if you recall, there was a great media splash uh, about a Marine, World War II Marine, returning a Yosagaki Hinamaru, which is a good luck flag, uh, to a family in Japan. And it was a custom for Japanese soldiers before they'd leave for war, their uh, village would buy them a flag, a rising sun national flag, and sign it with well wishes and prayers for the soldier, and they'd carry it with them. And uh, Marines during World War II, frontline troops, you couldn't get souvenirs like swords or anything else because you were fighting. Those things went to the rear echelon troops. But the frontline troops could collect these Yosagaki Hinamaru because they were very light, and you could fit a few of them in your backpack or uh, in your jersey or blouse. And, um, and uh, Air Corps pilots would pay $50 for a flag. So it was a lot of money that these guys would barter with. But Marvin acquired one um, on a covert mission into Garapan, where he developed this kinship with a dead Japanese captain that he saw lying in a field. And for some reason, he just tracked immediately to this dead Japanese captain. And he's going through his backpack, seeing pictures of a family and a mountainous area. And in the photo, he saw Montana. It was the same amount of children, mom, dad, same amount of kids as his family. And before he got up to leave, he saw the captain's flag sticking out of his uniform. And at first, he thought, well, I'll just leave it, because he knew it was sacred to the Japanese. But then as he, he had a second thought and said, well, if I don't take it, somebody else will. And if I take it, maybe I can return it to the family someday. And in August of 2017, this 90-some-year-old guy made this arduous trip to Japan. Um, we were able to find the family of the Japanese captain. And Marvin was finally able to return the flag. And uh, when the younger brother received this family heirloom, heirloom. He took it, held it to his face, and inhaled deeply, and said, you've taken good care of my brother. Roscoe Mullins is the last surviving member of the 40 Thieves that landed on Saipan. There are some replacement guys who might still be alive, but he's, he's the last one who was there on June 15th, 1944, when they landed. And he is 96 years old. And uh, 96 seems to be the, uh, I should spit three times after I say that, but my dad died at 96, Marvin died at 96, Bob Smots died at 96, Bill Knuppel died at 96. So I hope Roscoe can break that mold and make it to 97. And I was, I was tallying up, I think they each had to live through one, two, three, four, five, six or seven different bonsai attacks in, in, in the Pacific. That's, that's like a human tsunami of wrath and hatred descending upon your front lines. And, and, and the mileage that these guys had put on them the training that they would have to do in the shoes that they had to wear, marching for miles upon end. That's another thing of how my dad would always say, take care of your feet. You know, and it would always be a certain regimen of him putting powder in the different areas because these guys had to march so much. And, the, and guys in World War II aren't big, hulking, 
men. If you were over six feet tall, it would be surprising. On my dad's uh, Guadalcanal platoon roster, he lists their heights and weight. And five foot four was the minimum height requirement. And um, many guys were just five foot four, 130 pounds. One guy in, in the scout sniper platoon, Lonnie Jackson from uh, Centralia, Washington, when he first went to enlist in the Marines, he was only five foot three and a quarter. He wasn't tall enough to become a Marine. But he wanted to become a Marine so badly that he spent a week stretching himself. I learned this from his son, Don Jackson, who is named after Don Evans. That's another curious thing. A lot of guys named their children after fallen buddies. Um, and he spent a week stretching himself. He tied cinder blocks to his feet and then hung from a tree limb for a week. And then the next time he went in, he was five foot four, just tall enough to become a Marine. And there's a photo that's taken of Lonnie Jackson, smallest guy in the unit, with Don Evans, biggest guy in the unit, who was six foot three. And you look at Lonnie Jackson, and he looks like he could you know, be a Gerber baby. He looks so young. And Don Evans looks like he's you know, Colonel Von Raschke by now, you know, just this old, haggard man. Another thing about these Marines and how they had to do without, when they first went into Guadalcanal uh, to take on this seasoned Imperial Army who'd been at war for a decade already, the Marines were issued weapons, rations, and uniforms that were leftovers from World War I. So all they had to combat the Imperial Army were 1903 Springfield rifles, which carried a six, six cartridge magazine and was bolt action. And uh, some of the guys, when the M1 technology came out, um, they preferred the, they had grown so accustomed to using that that the accuracy and um, shocking power of the old Springfields, they found it preferable than the new M1s, which is why the Marines that uh, were in the Scout Snipers um, had Springfield rifles as well as another array of weapons to use, but their uh, Springfields had been accurized with a unertal scope, which is the technology of the day, which made it accurate up to a mile. I think a normal Springfield might be accurate to 500 um, yards. Um, and uh, all Marines were, were excellent shots, were, were sharp shooters. That was one of the prerequisites. I had a, when I would interview these fellows, I would take a camera, but the first thing that I noticed is they'd clam up. Yeah. And it's like they're ratting out a buddy. I'm not, I don't want, this is off the red build. <laughs> Bob, Bob Spots would go, this isn't for posterity, he'd say. <laughs> and that's like, you know, I'm writing a book, Bob. So like about stealing the Jeep or other things that he did.